I thought we could talk about at least one um, incident that is currently playing out, especially in America, and then we'll talk about the woman riding the beast. And then I got some suggestions or subjects to talk about. And one of them was Daniel chapter 12. So I think we'll talk about that. And if we have time, we'll talk about how we can trust in God, because that was also a question that I received. So I have to say, I have to say uh, Bruce, when I wrote all these suggestions, I thought one subject each night. Oh, well, all right. Well, we'll try. <laughs> we'll see. I, yeah, okay. Um, let, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we um, know that you're on your throne looking down upon this world and you see everything and you hear everything. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will help us now to, to see and also to hear the things that we need to know to prepare us for the coming of Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, what I find very fascinating at the moment in America is this Robin Hood saga, where um, where the uh, the average um, American and, and possibly other people around the world are taking on the uh, the, um, the big wigs on the, on Wall Street. There, these um, these hedge funds have have um, perpetrated what what I would call illegal fraud <laughs> on many occasions. What they do is they they short the stock on companies that they target, and they 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 place a bet, and the, and it's just a casino, really. The, it's, it's a glorified casino. They bet that the stock is going to go down, and then these these hedge fund managers they are considered gurus when it comes to um, Wall Street, and and they're always on on uh, TV shows talking about finance and shares and what people should invest in. And so because they short the stock on this particular company, they talk the company down. They want the stock to go down. That's what they want. And if they if they want the stock to go down, they will earn money. So, but these Robin Hood investors who are uh, ordinary, this Robin Hood app is designed for ordinary people that bypasses brokers. They don't have to pay brokers fees. So it appeals to the mass of uh, people out there who just have a little bit of money to invest. And what they did was, they all they all bought the stock of this company that was targeted. It was called um, GameStop. It's a, it's a actually a, it's actually a company which sells um, games on uh, not online. They're they're um, hard they're hard disk uh, games, and um, and they 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 boosted the stock up. And the the higher they boost the stock, uh, the more money these hedge funds are going to lose. There's phenomenal amounts of money they're talking about. It's a seventy billion dollars that they're on the hook for and um and so it's, it's playing out right now and uh and now they've launched another um attack into the silver market and and they're starting to recognize uh, realize the power they have to manipulate the market themselves and and what is interesting about about it is that people in the mass media they're waking up <laughs> some I, I was listening to a couple of them saying wow we knew the we knew the the market was rigged, but we didn't realize it was rigged this much. <laughs> and and it's what Trump was talking about during his um, uh, 216 uh, campaign. He talked a lot about the rigged system, and and people are not, people are seeing it now, and and it's becoming more self evident on a daily basis that the whole system is rigged. I'm talking about wall street, but then people need to realize that everything is rigged. <laughs> the political system is rigged. Uh, the whole country is rigged and it's this woman riding the beast who's doing it. <laughs> she's, um, she's the corrupt queen, the corruption queen. And, um, so what we're going to do now is, uh, talk about her, but all right. We need to have a little background on how prophecy works to understand who this woman is. And first of all, I, I want to reiterate what I said, that, that the, the beast that comes out of the sea in Revelation 13, as Adventists, we all know this is a picture of the Roman Catholic papacy. There's no, no argument about that. 
And then we see the exact same beast in Revelation 17, seven heads and ten horns and all the other accoutrements. So that must be the Roman Catholic Church too. But now there is a woman riding the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> so it would appear to me to be a separate entity. This woman has to be something separate from the Roman Catholic Church, but also a part of it. So now let's back up a little bit now. Let's, um, let's talk about how the book of Revelation reveals these things to us. And there are, there are words in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the book of Revelation that are placed there like codes and they have to be deciphered. And I'm going to give you an example before we talk about the woman on the beast, how this works. You take the river Euphrates. It's mentioned twice in the book of Revelation. So what we have to do now, in order to understand why it is mentioned in the book of Revelation, we have to go back into the Bible, the Old Testament, and look, about, look how the river Euphrates is used. And I'll give you an example. Um, in Joshua, Joshua is giving his last speech to the to the Israelites before he he uh, retires, and he says to says to them, "Our fathers lived on the other side of the flood." Now he's referring to the river Euphrates, and God took a, our our father Abraham out of the other side of the flood, out of the city of Ur, which is also known as the as Ur of the Chaldees. And he took him and took him over the river. And first of all, it's interesting that, that Abraham comes from, from Ur of the Chaldees because the Chaldees and the Babylonians are kind of synonyms. They're the same people. So God is calling Abraham out of Babylon and taking him across the Euphrates and placing him in the promised land, which is a symbol of heaven. And, um, and so we have the same situation in our time. We have to, again, the original call was out of Babylon and come over into the promised land. We have to do the same thing to the Babylon that exists today. We have to call the people out to cross over to the other side. So what the river Euphrates is, and by the way, if you, if you use a, um, a modern translation, these modern translations try and help you out, and they will take this word, the flood, and they will remove it and put in the river Euphrates. They think they're helping, but it's actually not helping at all. But it's obscuring the fact that the Euphrates is called the flood. It's called, it's, very seldom called the river Euphrates in the Old Testament. They call it the flood, or they call it the great river, or the, just simply the river. And what the river is, it's the boundary between Babylon and God's kingdom. So when we decipher all of that, then we understand why the word Euphrates is used in the book of Revelation. It's the, it's, talking about the boundary between God's kingdom and Babylon. And that's what we're supposed to learn from it. And incidentally, uh, because it's called the flood, this imagery, and by the way, it's called the flood because it's a snow-fed river, and at every spring it would flood. And so you have this imagery now of, of the water flowing over the border from Babylon or flowing into the promised land. And for example, when the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, invaded, um, invaded uh, Israel, and he, he, he managed to get all the way to, to Jerusalem, the Bible says he came like the flood, and the flood went all the way up to the neck of Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem is way up in the mountains. It's about 3,000 feet up in the air. And, um, and so you could, the imagery is of, when the when the, the Assyrian king Sennacherib comes to comes to conquer God's people, kill God's people, control God's people, he comes like a flood, 
and he goes like this. He goes, starts down here and he goes ding, 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 ding up to the neck. And you know the story, the angel went out and slew 180,000 of them and they all receded, they all went, the flood went back home again. So this is how, this is how the Bible now uses both the river Euphrates and flood imagery to tell us a story, to tell us what's going on. Do you remember in um, Revelation um, uh, 12, it talks about Satan casting out of his mouth a water, water like a flood to drown God's people. It's the same imagery. Okay. Now, once we know this, then we can decipher other. This is kind of like a principle. And there are other code words in the book of Revelation. And if we go to uh, Revelation uh, chapter 3, where it's talking about the seven churches. No, it's is chapter 2. Uh, we have seven churches. And as you know, they all indicate different periods of church history. And the fourth one is the, is the history of the Roman Catholic Church, when the Roman Catholic Church was supreme. And it says in there, you have in you have you tolerate that woman Jezebel. Now that's a code word. We have to go back into the Old Testament and we have to understand everything about Jezebel. What what did she do? What was she all about? How did God's people react? Well, you know the story. Abraham married her. He married a pagan princess. And what did she do? She brought all her pagan practices into Israel and virtually destroyed God's, um, God's people. God said, Elijah thought he was the only one left. And God said to him, no, I've got 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. So what that is telling us is the inroads of paganism into the Catholic Church. And the Catholics admit it. They, they actually admit it openly. Um, Cardinal Newman wrote, he has a whole list of pagan practices and he goes, ding, 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 maybe 20 of them. And he says, we brought them all into the Catholic church, but it's okay because we Christianized them when we brought them in. And the whole, the whole, what, what Roman Catholicism, Catholicism is, it's baptized paganism. It's, it's Christian in name, but in essence, it's paganism. It's simply they simply change the names of everything. Um, the, the statue of Jupiter, for example, in, in Rome becomes St. Peter. You know, <laughs> they just convert all these pagan things into Christianity. So this is what Jezebel did back then. And this is what happened to the Catholic Church. And it's still like that today. And so what we have when we get to the book of Revelation, we it, well, let me back up a minute. It, you just get this brief mention of Jezebel in the church in Revelation 2. But most people, if you talk to, if you talk to most people, they, they don't understand the, the Catholic Church as being pagan. They have no idea. They think it's Christian. Um, Alberto Rivera said, it's not actually Christian. It's the world's largest cult. And he, I'm sure you know who he, who he was. He was a a Jesuit who, who escaped the system. So it, it's pagan to the core. It simply uses Christian names and um, to cover the, cover the paganism. And so in, in uh, Revelation 2, you get a glimpse of that. That's why Jezebel is mentioned. You get a glimpse of it. But you don't see the pagan... Uh, essence of the Roman Catholic Church until you get to Revelation 17. And there you see the woman in all her glory rolling over the Catholic Church. She is paganism. She is Jezebel. And Alan White tells us that, that eventually all of that has to be exposed. It will be exposed, she says. And people are going to be amazed to hear that the Catholic Church is, is a pagan uh, church. And um, that's our job. We're, we're supposed to be doing this. But how can we do it if we don't understand what, um, <laughs> how, how to reveal it? We, we have to tell this story to, to people. 
and we will, and I believe we will do it under the influence of the of the latter rain. But um, and God will teach us; the Holy Spirit will teach us what we're supposed to say. And this is um, this is going to be something that uh, the people are going to be amazed when they hear it. And eventually, they're going to be so angry they're going to tear their false priests to pieces. She says, "Tear them apart." And and but this is. This is what we are supposed to be doing. We are supposed to be exposing this. So that's what I believe the woman on the beast represents. She, she's not in Revelation 17, uh, sorry, not in Revelation 13, because she's still under wraps. She's, um, everybody, everybody worships um, the beast, the Pope. In Revelation 13, because probably because they think he's God. So they don't understand yet that this is really just paganism. But when we when we get to the, the prophecies are built on repeat and enlarge. So all through all through Daniel and the book of Revelation up to chapter 13, it's talking about Babylon, it's talking about the beast, the Roman Catholic Church, and everybody thinks it's Christian. But when we get to Revelation 17, we have this additional information about the woman riding the beast, where she is now exposed for everybody to see. So that's what I believe the woman on the beast is. It is the Roman Catholic system, but it's in its in its fullness, in its true light. <laughs> so, so if you have any questions about that point, then we can go on to something else. Well. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> is is that uh, kind of new to the Adventists, or I don't know, but um, it may be. I don't know. <laughs> Any comments? You're welcome to. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, I I understand what you're saying, and what you're saying, I think, is absolutely true. But the Roman Catholic system is. The Roman Catholic uh, system was a church state system. They, they ruled the state and they ruled the church. The church, the, the religious part was the woman. The beast part was the, was the state because, you know, now the Vatican is its, is its own country. It has its own flag and, uh, you know, it's its own country. So in that sense, the woman is riding the beast but you know what? What's even more is that now that beast—I mean, that woman—is infiltrating God's church, yeah, with pagan ideas, pagan, pagan doctrines. Uh, the Trinity doctrine stands out, out in my mind foremost. That is a pagan doctrine that's been brought into the church and God's church through infiltration, and that—that that is a at its origin as a pagan doctrine. So that and Sunday worship and a few others. Oh, yeah. It's, I just I think just, it's infiltrating and being seen. Just um, just purgatory, for example. That's a that's a shocking pain yeah. In doctrine. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. but I, I do think I do think you do have a slight problem with. Um, the. Uh, the church and state thing. Uh, Let's go back to Daniel 2. Alan White says that the, uh, and this is something which has never been properly understood, I believe, in, in the, as Adventists. When we look at the, at the, at the um, iron and the clay, we often are taught, we are almost always taught that this is, this is a, a symbol of the system or the beast system or the Roman system, whatever you want to call it, partly weak and partly strong. But if you go into your Bibles and and check out what um, uh, I've talked about this before, but on this program, but let's do it again. Um, if you go into your Bibles and check out what uh, the Bible says about clay, um, you, you'll know that uh, Isaiah says, um, "We are the potter. We are the clay. You are the potter." And Jeremiah has that experience where he's taught about the clay as well. Um, so the clay represents um, God's people and the iron represents Rome. And so what Amen. you have, there, that's what you have. You have the church and state 
represented as the iron and the clay. And Ellen White actually says, she says, she says, um, the iron and the clay. Uh, no, she says churchcraft and statecraft is represented by the iron and the clay. And but this woman, I think, so what I'm trying to say is you have this church state union represented by the iron and the clay. But this woman, I think, is an addition to to what we are seeing, because, as I said, in Revelation 13, you have the what you have the beast, 10, he 10 heads and seven heads, sorry, 10, 10 horns and seven heads. And and we all know that's the Catholic Church. And then you have the exact same beast in Revelation 17. And that is also must be the Roman Catholic Church because it's the exact same beast. But now she's got a woman. And but previous in Re Revelation 13, we can't see the woman. We're not we're not we're not supposed to see the woman because she's not exposed yet to the world. That's our job. <laughs> and and when we get to Revelation 17, we see her. She's there. Everybody can see her or supposed to see her because she's paganism. That's the way I understand it anyway. Yeah, good night. Shell. Shell, good night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, entered a little uh, late, but uh, um, <clears throat> I don't know where you got the answer, Eva, to your question. Uh, I know quite a bit of what is going on in Norway, and uh, um actually this knowledge about uh, uh, Jezebel and uh, the Catholic Church and uh, so on the knowledge uh, is there but there are so many who have who have, have haven't um, um studied it and uh, um that it really sink in and uh, the normal most of i think the adventists uh, the member in the seventh adventist church uh, do think they are a christian church uh, in some ways but uh, the truth is actually what uh, Bruce says, it is actually not a Christian church at all. Mm -hmm. In Amen. fact, Amen. Not at all. It's a, such a fake. And I hope that that will uh, be understood of all the Adventist uh, members. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yeah, Mark. Yes, I I under I mean I understand everything that's being said is correct. <clears throat> but the beast the beast before the woman is riding it I thought represents uh, pagan Rome. Then when we, we then when we see the woman riding the beast that's when it became papal Rome. And the doctrines that they offer, you know, I understood the iron and the clay to represent, you know, like God takes clay and molds us. That's right. Into what the he clay. wants us to be. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> but in the papal in the papal system, the people, they're miry clay. They're not, they're not moldable. He calls himself God. And that clay is, is not able to be molded into anything that, that God would want. So that's, that's what I understood why it was miry clay. Because he says he's God and he can't mold that clay. But papal Rome and pagan Rome, I thought, was the, the difference between the, you know, the beasts. Do you have the SDA Bible commentary? No, I don't. Okay. That's where Ellen White's church, quote, quote is. When she says, when she says church, state, and, and, and um, church and statecraft, she's speaking of the Roman system, not necessarily... Protestants being included in that. It was it was just their their church state crowd. Yeah, well not true Protestants, no. God's people no. God's people are everywhere. 
um, but they're they're invisible, um, and some understand it and some don't. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe we yeah, I agree ask... with... Sorry. Come on, Mark. Uh, can maybe someone can uh, if someone has experiences with uh, if they have been testifying to some Catholics, how did I do it and how was the response? Maybe could have a little testimony time if someone has done that. Have you have you ever shared uh, the truth, Bruce, with uh, any Catholics when you have been out uh, coal portering, for instance? I know that you have been much out coal portering. Yeah, I, re I remember one incident where, um, uh, yeah, I, I knocked on a, a lot of doors and I came across a, a Catholic woman who was obviously very um, attached to her her church. And I tried to tell her from the book of Revelation how, how the Catholic church is revealed in there. And she said to me, oh, our priests tell us that nobody can understand the book of Revelation. So that's how she dismissed it. Yeah, the priests tell their people nobody can understand that book, and perhaps, except perhaps them themselves, the priests. <laughs> That's why. Right. But you know, it's not easy to come and confront people to say, you know, your church is like that. We really need wisdom to know how to do it, so we don't push them away before we even started. Oh yeah, yeah. It wasn't yeah. the first. It wasn't the first thing I. No, <laughs> no, good, <laughs> good. <laughs> Werner, did I see your hand? Or, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We... Mar Marta's family and even my family background is Catholic. And even today, Marta's uh, siblings are Catholic and we discuss, we can talk about Christ. We even could read in Matthew, we could explain. And like what some of the response would be, yes, we understand as Catholics that Jesus, he is, our savior and he is okay but the problem lies with the ground forces in other words with the leadership of that church which has another way of explaining the plan of salvation but just to believe that jesus is the savior there are many catholics out there who truly listen to his voice and can differentiate through the conscience, which God has, all of us have received that, that we can, they have the Bible as well. They have to do a Bible. And so there is much in there which points to Christ as our savior. And so there is still a part, a life, which, follows jesus and yeah, it, expects him to come revelation says that god's people are in babylon and um and uh, um, so many of them are going to wake up and leave yes yes so werner when you so you were a catholic once not myself marta was okay. but my my grandpa and part of his family, even to my father's brother and sisters, they were still Catholic until my grandpa got in trouble with some of the worship of Mary. And so they, they dismissed him from the Catholic church and he had to move to a Protestant canton, we call it, it's a Protestant province. And so that was very strong, even 45, 50 years ago. Today, it's all mixed up. It, it's exactly happening what Bruce also is talking about here. The beast is 
now revealing itself. And if we, I take it here from, it's the letter 232, and it says, what is it that gives power now to that beast? And we recognize the beast, but where is that power now coming from to reveal itself? And it says, this power, it is Protestantism, a power which while professing to have the tempters and spirit of the Lamb and to be allied to heaven, speaks with the voice of the dragon. It is moved by a power from beneath. So there is where it's now developing. It is Protestantism. It's in the United States. It's Protestantism, which is, you could call it also riding the beast. So have yeah. you, so your background, has that uh, somehow helped you when you are talking to Catholics? Have you could be, been using that, you know? Yes, for, I mean, the, the, the division was so great that when Marta and I met, Marta would say, no, nah, we never could um, join together for, I'm Catholic, you're Protestant. When we got to introduce, Marta wanted to introduce me to their, her family. When they found out I was Protestant, I did not make the cross at the meal time. It was for over a year. They would not talk to me. They would, I did not exist. Mm -hmm. So th there's still a great division there but that has now mingled and exactly as it happened to Protestantism, as it is happening to us in Adventism in Norway. Right. Yeah, Kjell Gunnar. Thank you, Werner. Um, in a way, it is the opposite story <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> uh, to what you uh, asked us to uh, to uh, have experienced. I had a uh, friend. He's dead now. He uh, had a trip to Spain. Went into a, a Catholic church to see the glory there, and uh, she, he became very impressed. Um, he had a longer chat with. Uh, the priest in that church, and uh, he returned to Norway, telling us what he had uh, said to that priest. Why are uh, Christianity uh, divided in so many churches? We have, we have the same God, and we all believe in Jesus Christ. Um, so he thought it was a horrible thing that we had divided and become a Protestant. That and he told this to quite a lot of Adventists, and they were in fact influenced by, by it. This shows us that it's so important that we can unfold this geese, this camouflage, this half truth and half lie. Uh, in fact, the Catholic Church, as a church, as a system, doesn't pray to the same God as we do. But most Catholic uh, uh, members do pray to the same God as we do. But Jesus, if we 
think we are not so much firm in our understanding and has so much knowledge that we can see the difference between th their systems um, uh, uh, opinion about uh, Jesus Christ and the SDA's opinion about <coughs> Christ then we are really uh, uh, bad uh, in a bad position uh, so uh, we must uh, follow this advice to thoroughly study God's word, words and see what is important to know and see whether our opponents accept the same details in these important things. Thank you, Shilgen Knight. Did I Thank see you, Anne and Mark? Or did it go down again? Yeah, I just put it down. I was waiting for everybody to get through. You know, I was just thinking about the Revelation 13. You know, it's telling us about both beasts. And the beast of the United States being the bastion of Protestantism at one time, the land that God used to, to bring his truth un, unmolested so that it could be studied out and come to an agreement with God. Well, we're told that that is going to make an, an image to the first beast, which is the, the woman riding the beast. So I think around the world, people need to be aware of these doctrines that are that are actual the first beast doctrines that are coming in and, and, and it's going to be prescribed one day that if we don't believe the way that the first beast says or the second beast which makes an image to the first that we're going to it, eventually there will be a death decree so i think churches around the world need to see these things compare the two beasts and see that that protestantism is making an image to that first beast the woman Mm -hmm. Very important, I think, that we understand that. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Can I can I make a comment on that? Sure. Um, they never, well, it, the Protestant Reformation has always had two wings. There's a, the left wing and the right wing. And historians call the right wing, the magisterial reformers, and the left wing they call the free church or the radical church. And the difference between them is that the magisterial reformers, uh, and they're called the magisterial reformers because they rely on the state. They are they build state churches. They rely on the magistrate to um, enact laws and to punish uh, dissenters, people that don't agree with them. Um, so they. They already when they never escaped from the Catholic system. They already built when they when they left the Catholic Church, they already built an image to the beast. They built the same system with different theology. And that's always going to give them a a, um, a bond of sympathy along with Sunday with the with the Catholic Church, the one that they left. Luther and Calvin and Zwingli, they all built state churches. They, 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 uh, that Ellen White says that um, both of them get corrupted by this, both the state and the church get corrupted because of the union between them. And, and of course, that's what the iron and the clay is, is all about. The Protestants never left it. The, the, um, the magisterial reformers, the one that built state churches, they're the ones who wrote the the history of the Reformation Church, they're, they're, they're supposedly the heroes, whereas the free church, nobody knows too much about them, but they are the people who rejected this union with church and state, and they, their whole modus operandi was to follow the Bible uh, as truly and as accurately as they could, and of course, and the people who built the state churches, the uh, Luther and Calvin and Zwingli, they persecuted these people. Um, Zwingli was the first Protestant to put another Protestant to death in Zurich. 
And he put his own friend to death, a man by the name of Mentz, I think it was. And he was he was an Anabaptist. He wanted to um, reject um, infant baptism. And the Zurich Council made a law against that and punishable by death. And guess how they killed these people? By drowning. They called it, oh, you want to be baptized again? Okay, then we'll baptize you a third time. And they tie him up and throw him in the river. That's what Zwingli did. And, and so this, they, they perpetrated the same error that the Roman Catholic Church did. Luther was the same. He advised his, um, his uh, um, German princes to use the sword on the dissenters. And Calvin, he, he murdered his opponent, Servetes. He said, if Servetes ever comes here to, here to, here to um, he wrote to another pastor, if Servetes ever comes here to um, Geneva, I will put him to death. And he did. He burned him at the stake. <laughs> hmm. These are Protestants. They're, they're, um, they're doing exactly the same as the Roman Catholics. They already, they never escaped. They've already, when they, when they said they left, they already built an image to the beast. It's already there. The free church are the only ones who, who re rejected this idea of church and state. It wasn't biblical. They, they studied their Bibles. And that they got more persecuted than anybody else. They were um, persecuted both by the by the Protestants and persecuted by the Catholics. And guess which heritage we come from as Adventists? Which side of the Reformation do we come from? Huh? Come on, you should know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we come from all, from different churches. All the churches. Oh, we come from the free People church. Of... We come from the free church tradition. Yeah. Well, sure. Um, the Methodists, the Methodists were probably the big, and the Baptists were probably the biggest um, uh, denominations today, which, which followed the free church tradition. And um, and most of the early Adventists, not all of them, but most, many of them were, were Methodists. Alan White mm -hmm. was a Methodist. Yeah. Well, you know, you know what makes this is my point. The point that I. I mean, I know you probably all know this, but the reason that those churches were free when they came to these shores is because of the, you know, the separation of church and state, the government that was set up on these shores allowed them, they escaped persecution, came to these shores, and now we can freely, you know, practice our faith the way we choose. But the, the point is, is that it's coming to a time where that freedom is going to be taken away, where it's... It's all going to be we're reversed. Not, <laughs> yeah, and we're going to have to decide. We're going to have to make decisions by faith not to go along with what they're going to say that we have to do. You know what I'm saying? The freedom that this shore's, shore's offered, I can see it dwindling. Yeah. Oh, it's, you know, as we as we you, look at the event. Yeah. You are losing your freedoms on a daily basis, I'm afraid. It's terrible what's going on. It's um, but unfortunately, it's it's prophetic at the same time. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's what, I, what I've always I've always mentioned that, you know, when we get in these conversations, I've heard many people really um, take a political stand on these events. And rather than looking at it through prophetic eyes, people are taking, you know, their, their worldly political stand. And I'm like, no, this is prophetic. This is not something we need to argue about politically or yeah it, there's no there's no salvation in politics <laughs> so bruce can you give us the latest update since biden uh, has uh, become president well i heard this morning i heard recently that he's passed um 42 uh, executive orders that, <laughs> he said, and I think I mentioned this before, he said himself that only dictators do that. <laughs> you see, you see, in the American system, the laws are supposed to be made by the Congress. And not even though even though they tolerate these executive orders from from presidents, because sometimes sometimes something has to act quickly and you can't wait for Congress to argue about something. So they pass an executive order. It's almost supposed to be used like an emergency uh, 
and and they're, they're supposed to be not used um, uh, liberally like Biden has done. But he's passed 42 of them in a little over a week. And he himself said only dictators do that. So what do you have? And one of the executive orders was um, was basically uh, classifying uh, uh, Trump supporters as well. He's he's. He's got a new classification now. You, you know, you used to have uh, terrorists overseas, but now, now he's passed an executive order about domestic terrorists. But guess who they are? <laughs> They're all his opposition. If you oppose, if you oppose the socialist agenda, then you are a domestic terrorist. Hmm. That's that's what it's going to come down to. So, Mark, do you feel any difference uh, being in America? Oh my gosh, yes. We, uh, I mean, I, I'm not personally affected yet, but um, with the with the COVID lockdowns and with the, you know, with the rules that are in place now, we can see it coming. Uh, Amy and I, you know, we see it coming. We talk about it a lot, but we we know what what's happening, and um, we know that the freedoms are being taken. Right now, it hasn't personally affected us though. But what's st- what state do you live in? Pennsylvania. Whoa, the controversial place. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, you know, it's what's funny is that driving around all year long, we saw so many Trump signs. I mean, this was once a Democrat state. And I'm going to tell you, I, I don't see how in the world Biden won Pennsylvania from what we've seen. It changed overnight. I mean, he was winning by a landslide, Trump was. And then the next day, <laughs> it was completely reversed. Yeah. And Biden had been like in the lead beyond what, you know, seemed normal anyways. <clears throat> but we're yeah, seeing a lot of businesses shut around here. Yeah, businesses are shutting down, small businesses. You know what is ironic? Um, they just had an election in the country of Burma and the military just took over the whole country, accusing the socialist government of um, election fraud. And um, Biden's government has come out and said, oh, you can't do that. You can't um, <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't take over a country because of election fraud. <laughs> I tell you, we are in an attitude of prayer, Amy and I, as I know uh, many people, we all are probably here, uh, but we're in an attitude of prayer and I, we're, we're just pleading with Christ to f- fill us with the spirit and show us where, you know, what to do, how to react. And it's time to really get right with God. That's for sure. I think that was a good last sentence. Maybe you would like to pray to Mark. I think that was very good. Uh, thank you so much, Bruce, for sharing today about the woman on the beast. And thank you, everyone, for sharing their thoughts. And uh, let's pray, Mark. Thank you. Oh. Father in heaven, we are so grateful that we can come together with with like-minded brothers and sisters that love you. And, and we just look to you, Father, for the direction that we need to go in and and put the people in our paths that we need to uh, to speak with on these, these things that need to be understood by men and women around this world. And go with each of us as we study your word and as we pray. Give us discernment and give us... Uh, knowledge to live in this world and to do the things that you'd have us to do to bring as many as we can into your kingdom when you come send your son fill us with his spirit we need his holy spirit to guide us his life living in us and we just thank you for that promise and we claim these promises now in jesus name amen